Chanson de Roland. Song of Roland. Uh, an epic of sorts. Uh, when we were reading Homer, we talked a little bit about how an epic poem is often about uh, more than just the characters in it. It is about the founding of a civilization very frequently, uh, the organization of that culture. Uh, and it lays out the values of that culture and serves as a kind of textbook for national identity. And the Song of Roland is in that vein. It's coming about in roughly the 11th century. We're not super sure on this. Um, there, uh, and it's, it's coming out in a time of the formation of what we would consider uh, the early roots of the modern nation state. Uh, with Homer, Greece wasn't really a place. It was just a very loose confederation of Greekish speaking people. Uh, and we talked about how the Homeric poem seeks to bring those people together to a certain degree under a certain national identity. And we get that with Roland. The, um, the legend is it is coming from uh, uh, a, a number of different sources, most scholars believe, but we've really only got like one primary document that has most of, uh, of this. And then we're, we can supplement and compare it with some other little fragments and other fairly compromised documents that come in. So it's got a very complicated, uh, rough uh, textual history, uh, which is something you would sort of, which is something you would expect from that long ago. Uh, this is not a uh, particularly bookish society just yet. Charlemagne, uh, as a uh, as a king and emperor. Uh, was known for promoting literacy, but even that is a fairly limited scope of who should be taught. Uh, before that, it was, Europe was really just absolute uh, dark ages, quite frankly. Uh, but through the greatness of Charlemagne, Charles the Great, Le Mans, uh, you start to get the, the rise of what becomes known as the courtly system, a series of uh, administrations centered around a monarch that uh, has a certain institutional structure. And there are nobles surrounding him, there are elements of uh, the, uh, the church who are there in a kind of sometimes adversarial, sometimes supplemental, uh, uh, sometimes downright commandeering role. Uh, but Charles was able to bring this together in a sense of national identity and unity that is fairly unique for his time. The, um, another historical element in here that is significant but never explicitly referenced in the, uh, the poem is the Crusades, uh, the series of military campaigns from Western Europe into, the, uh, into North Africa into the, uh, the, the eastern, the far eastern Mediterranean, into the Balkans, anywhere where Islamic rule had uh, taken over, essentially. 
throughout the six and seven hundreds. Um, the, um, the religion of Islam became the dominant force in, uh, in North Africa, and it spread considerably around the, uh, the, the lower Mediterranean. And for Europe, there were really two main issues with that. Number one, as it spread east and, uh, and north, it took over what became known as, uh, or what was known as, the Holy Land, which is Jerusalem and the hereditarily, uh, 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 the, the home of Judeo-Christianity. Um, Roland and the Song of Roland is the story of the Western Front of, uh, of, of the Islamic Revolution and tide of Muslim rule where it pushed up into Spain and ruled a, the, the dividing line was roughly uh, halfway up Spain but the, uh, the footprint of the culture was pretty uh, extraordinary beyond that so that it really Culturally, uh, it, there was dominance there, you could say. Um, for centuries, uh, Islamic scholars were the only action in town for intellectuals. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> most of Europe were really just a bunch of uh, croaking barbarians at this point, quite frankly. But the Song of Roland is the legend of a military campaign of the French, it's really kind of pre-French, the Franks technically, down south into Spain, led by Charlemagne, to try and push back and, uh, and basically obliterate the Islamic presence in Spain, in Europe. And it opens up, the, the poem opens up where Charlemagne's forces have been campaigning around Spain for quite some time, rampaging, pillaging, sacking, stealing, uh, all your basic awful medieval warfare stuff. Uh, and now they are moving back towards France. They're going uh, back up into the Pyrenees and down into uh, friendly territory. And the, uh, the plot of the poem, the story, if you will, is really about that, uh, that movement. And when he's moving this fairly gargantuan army, well, gargantuan size is very difficult to really measure in here because of the nature of the exaggeration. As they're moving, they have to have uh, a rear guard, basic military strategy. When you're all leaving, you don't want to turn your backs on your enemies whom you're leaving behind because you're, uh, you've got your back to them and they could very easily start picking you off. So the rear guard is probably the most dangerous place to be in, uh, in any military campaign like that. And so it comes down to a question of, well, who's gonna do this? And from there, you get the rise of the hero, Roland. Now, at the very beginning, it starts with a conflict between uh, Charlemagne, uh, Roland, and Roland's stepfather, a guy named Ganelon. Uh, Ganelon is um, not the best guy in the world. And he and his stepson have some family tensions, you could say. Uh, but Ganelon is coded almost immediately as a very sneaky little bastard and not one to be trusted. And they have this little scene where 
they're trying to decide who should go and uh, meet with King Marcillion. Uh, he gets spelled and pronounced a number of different ways. I don't really care which way, but be prepared for me to butcher the pronunciation in any way. Uh, somebody has to go and meet the, uh, meet the king there and just say, look, we've enjoyed uh, robbing, raping, pillaging, and killing for the last couple of years, but we're tired. We want to go home and enjoy the stuff we stole from you. So please just let us go. Not too much to ask. It becomes a question, though, of who is going to go and approach this king? Who is going to be the diplomat, the delegate, to go in and uh, get the all clear? Because, understandably, eh, there's some hard feelings there. If you've been rampaging around someone's country, uh, killing, raping, destroying, robbing, all that stuff, you can expect that enemy king to be a little hostile. So this is not a plum assignment. And of course, Roland immediately says, you know who'd be good at this? My stepdad. Ganelon should lead that delegation. Let him go. And Ganelon. Me? Huh? Eh? Huh? Eh? Huh? Eh? Uh, thanks for the, uh, the death warrant there, Roland. Uh, I don't really think so. But the way that transpires is significant. Charlemagne assembles everybody. It says, my noble knights, said the Emperor Charles, choose me one man, a baron of my march, and bring my message to King Marcellion. And Roland said, Ganelon, my stepfather. The French respond, why, that's the very man. Pass this man by and you won't send a wiser. Uh, everybody's happy to send Ganelon because that means they don't have to go. And hearing this, Count Ganelon began to choke, pulls from his neck the great furs of Martin, and stands there now in his silken tunic, his eyes full of lights, the look on him of fury. He has the body, the great chest of a lord. What the hell's going on there with that description? Why those details? What is that telling us about this guy? Hmm? He has the body and great chest of a lord. What does that tell you? Yes. He's not exactly fit. Maybe. He's, uh, he is an older man. Perhaps uh, he is not really uh, as spelt as he used to be. You know, let's go easy on the judgment here. But still, that sense of greatness, I would say, yes, fatness is part of that, perhaps, but the great chest of a lord, yes? I would say not all the description is the same, it's part of the novel part. Yes. So he's not fit for the war to go and Maybe. He is. One of the, uh, the, the upper echelon, shall we say, of this, uh, this army. Uh, one of the leaders, not necessarily one of the grunts. Um, the what? great, what? All the description, like, um, when it's sad that he was very... Well, like, the way you describe him, He's too noble to go and do the... Yeah. He is dressed really well. Yeah. The great furs of Martin. Right. His silken tunic. Kind of a dandy. Uh, hmm. Likes luxury. Likes fancy clothes. 
don't know about you, but I'm just thinking Paris and not the city. Paris, the little brother of Hector, who causes all the trouble, is untrustworthy, loves luxury, is a little self-indulgent, and is usually put in that position of being the cautionary tale. Don't be like him, he's a little soft. Be like Hector, Hector's a man's man. Hector's dutiful, Hector's not fancy. Hector goes out and does his job. Here, Marcelon, very early on, first entrance on the stage, you take, a, you take note of somebody and say, well, all right, you know, who is this character? And we are told about his fancy clothes and uh, how he has this kind of uh, aristocratic air. But based on what you now know, having read all the poem, what is the truth of Ganelon's nature? Is he honorable like a great lord? No, he is not. He is a traitor. So after being introduced in terms of his outward appearance, his clothes and his flesh, we are suddenly coded to understand, well, maybe that means he's trustworthy. Maybe that means he is noble, he is great. Maybe that is somebody to whom we should all aspire, that example to emulate. but it's a setup. He and Roland uh, have a little bit of an argument about who should, uh, well, about this suggestion that Ganelon lead the uh, diplomatic mission to, you know, their sworn enemy. Uh, Ganelon assumes that, well, this, this means I'll be killed. I'll go there, I'll say, hey, King Marcelion, how you been? And then he'll be beheaded before you even get to the part where you start to offer, you know, we would like to lead. In front of Charlemagne, who is sitting there watching everything, uh, the, the ever-present authority, he and Roland, Ganelon and Roland, have this little debate. If the king wills, I'll gladly go in your place. And Ganelon responds, He will not go, you will not go for me. You're not my man, and I am not your lord. Hmm. If Charlemagne wants something done, it should be done because of Charlemagne's authority within the logic of this poem. But here, Ganelon is saying, no, this is about you and me. You don't order me around, I can't tell you around. It's about the two of us. Individuals dealing with one another has nothing to do with Charlemagne's great authority one way or the other. That individualism is important. That sense of one man facing off against another man, irrespective of the authority structure in place. And significantly, he also references, Charles commands me to perform this service. I'll go to Marcelion in Saragossa and I'll tell, and I tell you, I'll play a few wild tricks before I cool the anger in me now. Hmm. Anger? He's angry? What sort of characters are angry? 
What does anger tell us about a character? Who else has been angry that we have read? Or perhaps let's crack open the thesaurus. Who else has been wrathful? Achilles. Achilles' problem was his wrath, was his anger. He would not let go of it, he let it consume him. And here, Ganelon is signaling that he is angry. He has a lot of uh, rage issues. He goes back to his men and he starts telling them about this plan. And his men who say, Baron, what bad luck for you. All of your long years in the court of the king always proclaimed a great and noble vassal. Whoever it was doomed you to go down there. Charlemagne himself will not protect that man. Roland the Count should not have thought of this. And you, the living issue of the mighty line. Pumping up his ego? Yeah. But also stirring resentment. That little speech that little speech suggests that you should be offended by this. You should be angry by this. It doesn't gall you to be treated this way. You don't have to take this. Who's that, Roland? Who's that Charlemagne to send you on this suicide mission? It's kind of embedded in that. That sense of resentment. Well, that even, well, you can see that stirring straight from the Garden of Eden, where the serpent goes to Eve and says, don't you want to taste the forbidden fruit? Don't you want to know what God knows? Who is God to tell you not to do something? That preying on human resentment, that temptation to anger with one another, fueled by a kind of greed, but it's more than just greed. Greed is about wanting something. Resentment is about hating that other people get stuff. You know? I want an awful lot, but if other people have it, it's really no, no big deal to me. But if you give in to that, that can eat away at your soul. So you can see some basic moral precepts getting laid out here, some basic characteristics getting flagged. There's a, uh, there is, an, I'm drawing some very specific connections with the Bible and with Greek epic. Uh, because this is all kind of in that same tradition, uh, both deliberately and unconsciously, I would say. Um, deliberately in that they are trying, this is a Western European rising civilization trying to culminate itself as a continuation of a callback to and a, uh, and a new iteration of the glory of the ancient past. This is, you know, Western civilization standing up and saying, damn it, we're not just a bunch of dirty hicks lying in the mud, which is what they were at this point in history, pretty much. But it's also a kind of unconsciousness because they're feeding on these same basic themes that percolate throughout all of literature at this time. And that same essential battle that we see 
between the authority structure of Charlemagne and what he represents, and also that individualist, resentment-driven impulse to fight back against that, to subvert it. The, uh, the embassy to Marcellion, and again, I apologize for my uh, pronunciations, uh, comes in a very diplomatic mode. Like, again, the Iliad, where you had an embassy of people going to meet uh, um, Achilles and try and appeal to him in very subtle ways to get him to do something. Uh, here you have this little innocent chat back and forth between the King Marcellion and the Ambassador Yanilon. And you can see in 43, Dear Lord Ganelon, said Marcellion the king, I have my army. You won't find one more handsome. I can muster 400,000 knights. With this host now, can I fight Charles and the French? Ganelon answers, No, no, don't try that now. Now. Hinting. You take a loss, thousands of your pagans. Forget such foolishness. Listen to wisdom. Send the emperor so many gifts, there'll be no Frenchman there who does not marvel. For 20 hostages, those you'll be sending, he will go home, home again to sweet France, and he will leave his rear guard behind him. There will be Roland, I do believe, his nephew, and Oliver, brave man, born to the court. These counts are dead if anyone trusts me. Then Charles will see that, the pri that, the, that great pride of his go down. He'll have no heart to make war on you again. So he's coming out and making the pitch. Kill Roland. Take out the rear guard. But then you look at the very next passage. Dear Lord Ganelon, said Marshal Yon the King, the exact same phrasing as the previous one. What must I do to kill Roland the Count? Ganelon answers, now I can tell you that. The king will be at seas in the great passes. He will have placed his rear guard at his back. There will be his nephew, Count Roland, that great man, and Oliver, in whom he puts such faith, and 20,000 francs in their company. Now, didn't we just hear about this rear guard led by Roland and Oliver? Isn't that a little repetitious? Were there times when you're reading this when you're realizing, didn't I just read that? Damn, this is slow. Didn't they have editors back then? Why the repetition? Why? What is the effect? You're allowed to say, well, it's the same. It feels like you're getting nowhere. But there are little innovations within that. He will bring 20,000 francs in their company. That's new information. So there's a repetition, but there's a development. There is continuity and stasis, and yet something new breaking out. This is a pattern that you will see again and again and again. This is a poetic device, but don't get too caught up in, you know, fancy English teacher stuff like that. Think in terms of what this is doing. When something is always the same, but suddenly a little different. That's not just the poem, that's life.
things happen, and they seem like they have always happened. But this time it's got a little twist. Something progressive, something new, within something very old and established. That continuity is an, is an essential part of this poem and the broader message of this poem. And the allowance for innovations within it are also significant. Bear that in mind. That repetition and development will be uh, crucial. Let's flip to 125. Marcelion sees his people's martyrdom. He commands them, sound his horns and trumpets. He rides now with the great host he has gathered. At their head rides the Saracen Abysme. No worse crim criminal hides in that company. Stained with the marks of his crimes and great treasons, lacking the faith in God, St. Mary's son, and he is black, as black as melted pitch, a man who loves murder and treason more than all the gold of rich Gal Galicia. Hmm. What does that make you think of? Mm -hmm. You can say it out loud. Where are all my little cancel culturers? This is bald-faced racism. The Saracen, which is another word for the Muslim, abysme, which is, okay, maybe that's an exotic name, but it also naturally draws to mind the word abyss, abysmal, something very dark and miserable. He is no worse criminal rides in that company. He is an awful, awful human being. And specifically, what we are told about him is his appearance. He is black, as black as melted pitch. That's pretty explicit. There's not a lot of sugarcoating that. This is racism. Now, this is an important thing to recognize and just see how it is being used. Consider, this poem is coming out of France. What, what is today France? It is about a campaign to the south where Muslim rule has taken over, having emerged out of North Africa. The racial coding is very deliberate. This poem is arguing for a kind of reemergence of uh, Christian white culture in opposition to what they see as the Muslim interlopers in the South, who are darker, who are uh, of a, uh, a heathenish religion. And obviously, this poem is not particularly expert in the subtleties of the Muslim faith, because they are often called pagans, which even then meant a belief in more than one god, and that is not Islam. <laughs> Uh, they are, we are told at various points that uh, these people worship Muhammad when they really don't worship Muhammad. Muhammad is a prophet. They worship Apollo, the Greek god. And they also worship various kinds of uh, devil figures and witches throughout. Uh, wireless in the Pyrenees was rough, so you couldn't get Wikipedia very easily. They could not find out what the hell Islam was actually about. But they just couched the entire culture in a kind of vague otherness. This vague boogeyman of a culture that would be uh, easily caricatured and dehumanized. 
uh, once you dehumanize a people, it's much easier to go and kill them. And that's part of what this poem is looking to do. And where this goes, I think is uh, also significant, this one little stretch. The archbishop will never love that man, no sooner saw than, uh, than wanted to strike him. Considered quietly, he said to himself, that Saracen, a heretic, I'll wager. Now let me die if I do not kill him. I never love cowards or cowards' ways. That's a bishop. That's supposedly uh, an exemplary representative of the church, the Catholic church. Now, that's significant as well. Is uh, bragging about how you want to go kill someone, is that really uh, what we would consider godly in any faith? No. Now, historically, this needs some caveats. Number one, the Vatican at the time was uh, alternately a little on the murderous side. Uh, at different points in its history, it has had armies, it has uh, engaged in conquest, it fostered a lot of the uh, crusades to take back the land from, uh, from, the, uh, the, from Muslim rule. Uh, so, the idea of a pure uh, Vatican uh, representative is a little bit of a legend. Even so, however, this is particularly bloodthirsty. And throughout, you see him uh, engaging in some pretty awful behavior, really slaughtering people just on this page itself. Uh, and the French say, a fighter, that archbishop. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit weird. That gives a certain, um, a certain window into the power dynamic of the authority of that era as well. Charlemagne is the emperor of the Franks. He is the king of what is becoming France. He is the big dog in that neighborhood. But he knows that just a little east of there, on the peninsula of Italy, there's another guy who thinks of himself as the big dog. And that's the Pope. And that relationship of the church and the rising nation state is a point of great friction throughout this time. The, uh, when, um, when Charlemagne was first, had, first had himself uh, crowned emperor on Christmas day in the year 800, I believe, uh, he had it done by the Pope. He had the Pope designate him that. And just think about this power dynamic. The Pope had been used to throughout, uh, throughout these uh, medieval European uh, uh, centuries, he had been very used to being the only authority in town. There were lots of little principalities around, nobody took them terribly seriously, you know, small little communities out there that he can as Pope, he can sort of play against one another and basically threaten, and you know, they were all there to support the Pope. But now these nation states are growing up, these kings like Charlemagne are growing up and challenging that authority. And by asking the Pope to crown you emperor, you are both submitting to the papal authority, but also he had the Pope do it. He got the Pope to do that for him. So there's a weird power dynamic going on here that the Archbishop is largely representative of. He is a, he is a representative of the Catholic Church in general in its relation to 
the, uh, the aristocracy. Here, significantly, he is functioning on the level of Roland and Oliver and all of the other knights, essentially, all of the lower royals, not at the level of Charlemagne. So written from the French perspective that is celebrating Charlemagne, he is going to, they are going to prioritize Charlemagne as just a little bit more important than the church. But at the same time, the presence of the priest, no matter how uh, brutal he might act or immoral we might judge him to be, the presence of the priest lends a certain uh, holy Christian legitimacy to everything that Charlemagne does. And the poem is trying to build that legitimacy. Um, One thirty one. Roland and Oliver are arguing about um, basically, basically, they're arguing over how to get go about their mission. They're in trouble. Um, it's a question of do we want to call for help? Do we want to blow a horn that will signal to the retreating forces of Charlemagne to turn back and come rescue their rear guard? The elephant that pops up uh, every now and then is a horn. It is a, the elephant is related etymologically to elephant, and the elephant tusk is made into a horn. So, you know, it's a weird word, but you just go with it. But 131, and Roland said, why are you angry at me? Oliver answers, companion, it is your doing. I will tell you what makes a vassal good. It is judgment. It is never madness. Restraint is worth more than the raw nerve of a fool. Restraint! Again, we are back in the realm of the ancients. Restrain yourself is the advice that just about every character gives to Achilles. Don't give in to your anger. Don't give in to your lusts. Hold that in and work and play well with others. Don't get carried away. That constant drumbeat of rationalism is throughout this poem and throughout pretty much all of all of Western literature and honestly you see it throughout the East as well. We saw it an awful lot in uh, um, in Confucius and it pops up in uh, in in the epics of uh, of, of this of, uh, of uh, what is it uh, India, but that sense of keeping your cool, thinking your way through it, not getting carried away is prioritized here. It is considered, it is raised very conspicuously. Roland is saying, I can't call for help because that would be a dereliction of duty. That would be a betrayal of everyone. I swore to protect Charlemagne and his army. And it would be shameful for me to go and ask them to come back and save me now. Oliver is a little bit more practical and saying, okay, that's a lovely sentiment, but you're a little puffed up with yourself here. Let's not get carried away. We're going to get slaughtered. And maybe, maybe, Charlemagne would rather have an army that is still intact than have you to point to and say, well, you know, he gave it all and died on the battlefield. Well, that's nice, but isn't it also nice to have your great warrior still with you, alive? Uh, Oliver is expressing a kind of faith in humanity rather than honor. 
And this is another dynamic that we see playing out here. For Roland, it's all about the honor, all about I have to be honorable, I have to live up to my word of serving Charlemagne. That is my honor and it is sacrosanct. Oliver is coming at it from a little bit more of a rationalist perspective and saying, well, okay, you know, honor is a big word, but let's just talk about reality here. Let's just talk about practicality here. Uh, we are worth more alive than dead. And this debate doesn't really resolve. The, uh, the advancing armies get closer. Roland resists sounding to call for, uh, for help until he finally does. Um, but it's too late. They are all uh, essentially slaughtered. Roland returned to his place on the field, strikes a brave man keeping faith with Durandal, his sword, struck through Faldron de Puy, cut him to pieces, and 24 of the men they valued most. No man will ever want his vengeance more. As when the deer runs, turns tail before the dogs, so the pagans flee from Roland the Count. Said the archbishop, you, Roland, what a fighter! Now that's what every knight must have in him who carries arms and rides on a fine horse. He must be strong, a savage, when he's in battle. For otherwise, what's he worth? Not four cents. Let that four cent man be a monk in some minster, and he can pray all day long for our sins. <laughs> the archbishop is a badass. Uh... The fighting gets an awful lot of play, and it is also reminiscent of the Iliad. Uh, you know, the, with this sword, this magical, not magical, but this holy sword, Durandal, they name their weapons, it is a very key part of their identity. Uh, he cuts 24 men uh, to pieces, and, uh, and, and because the so-called pagans the, uh, the Spanish uh, uh, Islamic forces, because they are uh, morally suspect, they are running away. So they are fleeing. They are terrible, horrible uh, warriors who are just going to kill us all, but at the same time, they're running away. Uh, the logical consistency is not really there. This is not on the same level of artistry as the Iliad, I gotta tell you. It's a little bit more uh, slapdash in a lot of ways but it has its moments. And by seeing that, you know, those little seams that pop up here, it makes you appreciate the more seamless quality of, uh, of, uh, of the stronger works. But significantly, again, we have the archbishop giving a kind of, uh, uh, well, giving a little locker room speech. Uh, very reminiscent of the, the speech, well, it's prefiguring that reminiscence, it's prefiguring the speech of uh, Henry V, Shakespeare's play at the Battle of Agincourt. You know, men, uh, you know, men will, uh, old men dying uh, in their beds years hence will remember this day and the glory of it. And people who, uh, who weren't here will regret that they weren't here, even though they too, Henry V uh, and all of them are about to die. Uh, or that was the fear, um, up against insurmountable odds. That kind of glory of warfare, that glory of self-sacrifice. Uh, and, and that little shot he takes at the monks. This is a bishop. Again, you always have to remind yourself, Turpin is an archbishop the representative of the church, and he's taking a shot at the monks. Let that four cent man be a monk in some minster. Ta! Let him go pray all day. What's that gonna get you? This is a precept now. But think about the power dynamics there too. The archbishop is a, uh, 
relatively high up member of the Vatican aristocracy. He is Mr. Institutional. Monks, by contrast, tend to be uh, much more independent. Monasteries throughout this era would exist off in the woods, off in the mountains, off isolated from the things of this world, and they would go about what they have to do. They would say their prayers however many times a day. They would, you know, they copied a lot of books, very valuable, but uh, they were removed from this world. The archbishop, by contrast, is obviously very much in this world. Politically, he's very connected to Charlemagne and Roland and all of these guys. And obviously, he's also pushing that into the realm of participating in military campaigns, even to the point where he does some pretty god-awful slaughtering in this poem. So he is the institution who is saying martial activity is good. Worldly activity is good. And those monks who just want to sit off in their little uh, monasteries and pray and keep to themselves, they're just stupid. They're just silly. They're pointless. They have no effect. And that just helps marginalize those people and centralize authority around the existing structures, the church and Charlemagne. So you see how all this is deliberate. He's taking shots at very specific targets that benefit him. Herpin does, and the poet is doing the same thing. The poet is drafting a world where authority is everything. Centralized authority is good. I remember Charlemagne, the rise of the nation state was very new. The idea of a national identity, of nationalism itself, is very new. Knitting together all those little communities out there into one coherent whole, you sort of see that in the Trojan War, trying to bring them all under the banner of Greek, but here it's really starting to take place as a political reality because Charlemagne has that kind of broad-based power. Um, mm, uh, yeah, go on there. Uh, Marcelon retreats. Um, and essentially disappears. The significance of him as a character, he's this big, bad, evil guy, and then uh, a little more than halfway through the poem, maybe up to two-thirds, he just kind of disappears. He, he's killed off, and yeah, nobody cares. Uh, he's killed off eventually, he disappears before that. But the idea is he's, um, he's just not that important as an individual. Now, part of that is more griping at the insignificance of, uh, of the Islamic forces, the basic racism of that. Uh, but part of that is uh, about the nature of the threat that the French saw. In 143, what does it matter if Marcillion had fled? His uncle had remained. The Algalife. I don't know what the Algalife is, the caliph. But when the poem actually explicitly says, what does it matter that he left? There's another guy right there that is inviting you to sit there and speculate. Well, okay, there is another guy. You know, normally when I read a story, when the bad guy uh, is knocked off, that's the end of the story, right? 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 Yeah. That's how I understand stories. I don't know about you guys. But here they're saying, no. Nope. You pluck one out, another one 
pops up in its place. Now, that is again very dehumanizing. Marcillion is not granted any dignity of uh, individuality here, any dignity of his personhood. But the nature of the threat that there's always going to be someone else popping up as long as there is a coherent force. The goal of the uh, Crusades, which most scholars believe was happening, what developed uh, shortly after this poem was, uh, was essentially composed. The goal of that was always to go in, well, to go in, to uh, steal a bunch of stuff and, you know, to nominally take back the Holy Land. Um, but then they would all, you know, pack up and leave. They'd go back to Western Europe. In that vacuum, they didn't win very often, but if they did take back some land, once they abandoned it, the Muslim forces would move in again and reestablish uh, their their rule. So by saying, what does it matter if you killed one king, the next one steps right in? Well, that's kind of a way of saying the only way to solve the problem of that king being there is to eradicate everyone, take them all out which is a chilling idea, because then we're advocating genocide. 171, now Roland the Count feels his sight is gone, gets on his feet, draws on his final strength, the color in his face now lost for good. Lots of references throughout this to the color of one's face. It's not subtle. Before him stands a rock, and on that dark rock, in rage and bitterness, he strikes ten blows. The steel blade grates, it will not break, it stands unmarked. He is afraid that he is dying, and that his sword, Durandal, he names it, uh, will fall into enemy hands. And it is a good sword, it is a great weapon, and in the hands of the enemy, it will thus be turned against the French. And he doesn't want to see that happen. He identifies with the sword. Again, you should be saying, ding, 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 the armor of Achilles and all of those Greek soldiers that so desperately fought for their armor. Uh, but he goes and he takes this sword and he starts to hack at a rock to try and break the blade, break the sword, render it unusable. And he can't. The sword as his identity cannot be broken. The sword as a symbol of martial value, of warrior uh, integrity, and also of a kind of Christian warrior ethic, because he's using it to kill anti-Christians, let's say. He is fusing all that into this image of a weapon. And that is a weapon that is a reflection of himself and his own values, which then serve as a uh, a symbol of the nation as a whole. If you are French, after Roland, you identify with absolute devotion to authority, Christian piety, warrior ethics. All of this is tied up in this kind of ideal for what a French person is supposed to be, for what a European is supposed to be. All of this is tied together and in essence weaponized into this image of uh, 
Christian European identity that can then be marshaled and opposed to everybody else. This is creating a hero that can then justify every atrocity that happens throughout the Crusades, every attempt at genocide. The uh, I don't want to get too bogged down, but he dies. Roland dies. Charlemagne's forces are a little late coming back, uh, and they come back and they find the entire force slaughtered. And Roland was the last one really to die. Roland uh, dies, Oliver dies, uh, the archbishop dies, uh, and they are, you know, it, they go down fighting because that's what a good Frenchman does. And you get this interesting little scene towards the end where you get, it, it, it's a weird little coda where they have a trial for Ganelon. Ganelon is, they recognize, oh my God, he's a sneaky little bastard and he sold out his stepson. So they host a trial. And some interesting things happen there. And again, it's weird that this is how it ends. Because it was this great, you know, battle scene with lots of dying. And then suddenly we're in this legal proceeding. But again, to invoke the Iliad doesn't end at the end of a great battle. It ends after it is a negotiation, a protracted discussion. Here you get a, a kind of trial where everybody admits right away that Ganelon is guilty of betraying um, the, for, the, the, the rear guard and essentially conspiring with the Muslims. Uh, that isn't really debated at all. But what's at issue is the nature of the offense. Ganelon himself objects. Said Ganelon, let me be called a traitor if I hide what I did. It was Roland who cheated me of gold and goods, and so I wanted to make him suffer and die and found the way. But treason? No. I'll grant no treason there. What's he saying there? It's kind of like what we saw at the beginning. It says nothing to do with any big thing like treason. It's about me and him. I didn't like him. He didn't like me. We had friction going a long way back. It's just about us two. I didn't betray the state. I didn't betray the nation. I didn't betray the people. This is just about me and my feelings towards that guy named Roland. And in this little trial, significantly, it's a little hard to follow. But Charlemagne calls together a group of uh, elder statesmen among his, uh, his nobles, essentially convenes a bank of judges to come together and they will preside over this trial. And then Charlemagne just kind of steps back. He empowers a court to decide Ganelon's fate. And this question of Ganelon acting just to betray that one guy, Roland, or through Roland, the entire nation that he represents, that's really about 
the rule of law. Gamelon is arguing for a one-on-one -on -one type interpretation of this crime. Yeah, I'm guilty of killing my stepson. People do that. That's not a big deal. It has nothing to do with the nation, with the state. He doesn't even acknowledge that that really exists as a concept. He is arguing for that human level bitterness, that resentment from one to the other. Treason by its nature is to an institution, to a nation, to a people, not to an individual. So he doesn't even recognize it. That makes no sense. How do you betray a nation? There's no nation here. There's just a bunch of individuals. My beef is with Roland. We settled it. He's dead. These things happen. But that sense of institutionalizing a society, a hierarchy, a rule of law government, that comes with consequences. And once you do that, then you can, then there is a nation to betray, a nation against which treason is the appropriate punishment. So in this little debate, it becomes a matter of debating whether or not they are a nation, a nation of laws, that can support a court system like Charlemagne has essentially set up, independent of his own power. Most other kings previously would probably just say, well, yeah, make your cases to me and I'll decide. But no, he institutes a court, a jury of peers. Does that phrase sound familiar to anyone? A jury of equal, distinguished members of society who will decide among themselves how to judge one of their equals. It ends with a kind of trial by combat, which is a little bit weird because you're going from an institutionalized justice system, which is impressive, for its time, and then it just devolves into essentially a duel between these two guys who club the bejesus out of one another and one of them dies. But the court allows for that to happen. The court creates a kind of institutional rule for that. It lays out very specific rules of, okay, if you want to do this, you each have to uh, both sides have to cede your, uh, your lands over to, the, uh, to Charlemagne. There's one guy who's arguing for Ganelon, one guy who's arguing against Ganelon. They both have to give over all their property to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Charlemagne. And whoever wins, i.e. lives, will get their property back. And Charlemagne will keep the losers, uh, the dead guys. It's creating an institution, a rule of law, a civilization that incorporates and accepts its level of violence, its natural brutality, while trying to control it, while trying to contain it, to give it a, uh, a legal framework through which violence can be worked out in a variety of ways, and potentially ways that aren't so violent. The One of the great scholars of this era is a uh, He's a Dutchman or a Swiss, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, his name is uh, Huizinga. And he was a historian of the mid to late 1800s. And he wrote at one point a very famous book on this era. 
And he said that the elaborate um, the elaborate courtesy, the elaborate artifice of the society, the genteel manners, the way of speaking in a very arch way, the bizarre sometimes behavioral performative uh, nature of their, uh, of, 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 of their way of expressing themselves was a kind of politeness meant to mask great brutality. That they were trying to go in a very sophisticated way, trying to pretend they're, they're all so delicate and civilized, and that is just a way of hiding the fact that they're all just brute animals clubbing one another in the most barbaric way they can. And you can see that throughout this poem. This poem lays out a scope of behavior that is at times like, you know, why, why are you so concerned with honor? Why are you so concerned with the proper way of doing things? Uh, there is much uh, formality going on here that is a little off-putting sometimes, a little confusing for the reality of what they're doing. Why is Roland so caught up with the idea of, oh, no, I can't call for help because that would be a sacrifice of my, 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 my dignity? You know, what good is dignity if you're about to get slaughtered? You and, you know, however many thousand men that you're guiding. But that knot of civilization and barbarity is always there fighting within one another. And you can see that in the court system. You can see that in the brutality of the, uh, of the war itself, where they're so concerned with, uh, with propriety, but they're still just absolutely slaughtering one another in the most inhuman fashion. You can see that in the figure of the archbishop, who is a man of God, but man, he loves to kill as well. All of these little knots of meaning intersect. And it's through that that you can start to see the medieval world getting worked out and the ground being laid for the early modern era to come in a few centuries known as the Renaissance. The artifice is part of the point. It might make it weird. It might make it confusing. It might make it a little hard to get close to when you're reading something and you're realizing, wait a minute, he just repeated that line right before. Why is it taking so long? Why do they always have to say the same thing? That all points out the artifice, the falsity of that. And there's a great philosophy about well, the world is all artifice and all the real meaning is the divine spark within that we can't actually see. So we just have to try and puzzle out the material world around us to see that inside divinity. That's one approach to it. But another thing is that, well, the material world, the stuff we can see, it's all just fake BS. And we have to understand that. And once we understand that, we can deal with it a little bit more. Now, the final lines of this poem are really kind of famous, and they're a little confusing. Here ends the song that Turold composes, paraphrases, amplifies, that Turold completes, relates. Here ends the tale that Turold declaims, recounts, narrates, that Turold copies, transcribes. Here ends the jest, for Turold grows weak grows weary, declines. Here ends the written history. Here ends the source that Turl turns into poetry. Now, Turl is supposedly the poet here. Uh, maybe he is, maybe he's not. Maybe he's just a guy who wrote down the poem. Maybe this was originally an oral poet and he is just sort of doing what Homer did, perhaps, and writing it down. Who knows? 
Uh, but the point is, it, it makes by ending the poem like this, and a lot of stuff in this era in like this, uh, it points out that, well, yeah, this is all just a poem. This is all just art. This is all just fake. This is appearance. This is artifice. This is falsity. But through that, we can maybe start to see glimmers of divinity, sparks of meaning within it that give a sense of the eternity beyond the material. And it starts by objectifying and recognizing it's not real. None of the characters in here are particularly believable. They're all just flat stick figures moving around. There's no sense of a round, real human being in any of them. And the closing lines, Cheryl composes, paraphrases, amplifies. Those are all words that means, you know, he, uh, he makes something up or he just changes something that already exists, or he exaggerates something, or maybe he minimizes something. But he's just adding layer upon layer of falsity. Maybe there was an original tale of Roland, and this is just an exaggeration of it, or this is just an evolution of it. No matter what, it is about a story that has been encrusted upon by multiple layers that need to be interpreted, just like the multiple layers of material reality need to be interpreted as containing the spark of the divine. All of this points to the society that these people were growing up with. All of this gives a sense of the people and the history and the reality. It is a great story. It is at times poorly written. And it works as great poetry on a number of different levels. Again, translation can make that difficult. But through it, you can see these little motions getting enacted to create a kind of civilization, create a kind of culture where powerful people like Charlemagne, like the Archbishop, like the peers around them, the nobles, where they are respected for their national values, where the nation that surrounds them is respected for having a specific identity in contrast to everybody else around them, and where that identity can be used at the behest of the leadership as logically a weapon to go out and conquer more lands, take more stuff, invade other territories, all for the glory of that established power back home. It is propaganda in that right. It's just a whole lot more in addition. <laughs>